I'm Anita. I was born in New Zealand. I've lived the last 14 months in Latvia, the first seven in Riga, and now I live here in Liepāja. Hello. Hi, Mara. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Beaming in from Riga to Liepāja today. <laughs> <laughs> and you were telling me that you have blue skies and I have snow, which is pretty oh, We, we do. It, um, it snowed last night. Yeah, we, we thought that um, spring was on the way, but no, winter came back. Yeah. And uh, we met, if I remember correctly, on a Latvian citizenship site where you were planning to move to Latvia from New Zealand. And so I'm really intrigued. I don't think we've had anyone from that far out. Oceana? Oceana, is that the right term? Yeah, Australasia really is Aust the Australia. Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Well, growing up in the States, they don't really teach us <laughs> what to call that area other than the specific countries. <laughs> but um, I don't think we've had anyone join us yet from uh, Australasia, so it'll be It's quite a long way away. Um, New Zealand is about 17,000 kilometers from Latvia, so yeah, oh, fair seven. distance. Wow, wow, that is really, really far. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I am going to jump right in uh, and ask you a little bit about where you grew up and what it was like there. Okay. Um, I was born in New Zealand's capital city, Wellington. Um, it's where the government sits. It's um, based around a harbour, so it, it doesn't have a lot of room to grow in many directions, but um, it has a lot of very well-established older suburbs. I went to high school in the middle of the city. Um, I actually lived in Wellington twice in my life. We moved to Christchurch, which is in the South Island of New Zealand, lived there for a few years, went back to Wellington. Then in 1984, we returned to Christchurch, South Island again. And I lived there until I made the decision to move to Latvia. Wow. And uh, briefly for people who haven't been to New Zealand, myself included, what what are the differences between the North and South Island and differences between those cities, if any? Okay, um, the North Island has two main cities, Auckland and Wellington. Wellington is where Parliament sits, but Auckland is bigger. Auckland is like, um, I suppose the city it's most like that I've been to would be Sydney. Um, it is a harbour city with lots of big buildings. Um, it's very multicultural. There's a lot of nightlife. It's an amazing place, but also a very expensive place to live. Mm. Um, Wellington is, I think it has a calmer pace than Auckland, but um, it's still a really vibrant city to be in. The South Island is quieter. It has a much smaller population than the North Island. Um, there are two main cities there, Christchurch and Dunedin. Um, a lot of farms, mountains, beaches, forests. Um, New Zealand is really a beautiful, beautiful place. Great. And for you, tell us a little bit about uh, growing up there, what that was like, um, and, and specifically about your growing up there, because I know we'll, in a moment, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about your, your Latvian roots, um, but tell us about your yeah growing up in New Zealand I was lucky I was quite privileged um our parents made sure that we had a pretty nice lifestyle um I grew up with my sister who's two years younger than me um there was some sibling rivalry throughout there possibly still is but she's my sister um I, when I was maybe 10, I rode ponies a lot. I was really into that. I um, had pets, I had rabbits, guinea pigs. Um, 
budgies. I had tadpoles that turned into frogs, but they jumped out of their little pond thing and disappeared. Um, so we um, we had a, a tree house in our backyard with a swing. So we spent a lot of time outdoors as children. Um, we'd go on family trips to lakes and rivers. We, we traveled pretty much everywhere in New Zealand, including um, Stewart Island, which if you look on a map, it's the little island at the bottom of the South Island. Um, not a lot of New Zealanders have even been there, but my parents thought it was vital that we saw New Zealand. So we spent two weeks there when I was about seven or eight. Um, it was probably a little bit primitive for my city girl tastes, but it was a, a fabulous experience to have. And I'm so grateful to my parents that they gave us that. Um, I got to do things like go to art classes in the weekends. Um, it was, it's a pretty safe place to be as well. So from a reasonably young age, um, we could go out on our own or with our friends and, and our parents didn't worry too much about us. I think that might've changed. It could be just, it was safer back then than it is now, generally speaking, I'm not sure. Um, I rode a bike everywhere. When I went to high school, I biked, I think it was a 10 kilometer round trip to high school, but um, other kids did it, so it was fine. Um, that was in Christchurch in Wellington. Everyone took the bus. There was one girl in my high school there who biked. She had her own bike rack. But um, so there were a few differences between the places that I lived as a child. Um, but generally speaking, it was a really good childhood with quite a lot of freedom, um, a lot of space to create, um, time to myself to write or draw. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd change much about my childhood. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Um, especially now that you're in a new place and probably reflected even more on what it was like to, to grow up in a, in a different country. Um, what might be, you know, in brief, what might be some generalizations of how you might describe um, New Zealanders or New Zealand culture? Maybe are, are there specific things that maybe are very, you feel are particular to New Zealand that other people from other places might not know about? Yes, definitely. Um, the Maori are the indigenous people to New Zealand. So other cultures arrived over the last couple of hundred years. So they're relatively new. There is no a New Zealand culture as such, like immigrants brought their own cultures. We um, celebrated our own traditions and had our own ceremonies and customs and so on. Um, but the Maori culture, I, I think everyone has been exposed to that to some degree. And it's really, really fascinating. Um, the food, um, the dress, the songs, it's, it's totally unique. Um, so I was really lucky to have been exposed to that, um, but also to have um, some European culture as well. Um, in New Zealand, there is very much a um, jandals and barbecue thing going on in the summer. Um, summer kind of lasts forever in New Zealand. It, it sort of shuts down. People. Um, go on holiday, officers are on skeleton staff, people will go to their batch by the beach or whatever, um, cook food on a barbecue, wear shorts and jandals and get terribly sunburned. It's, it's just kind of the, the Kiwi way. And that's actually something else too. Um, Kiwi is the um, native bird of New Zealand. Um, and it's also what New Zealanders call themselves. We are Kiwis or there's a Kiwi. But um, I've noticed that anyone outside New Zealand calls what we call a kiwi fruit a kiwi. So that's kind of strange to our ears to, to hear what we consider a bird or it is a fruit. Mm, yeah. And, and at least in the States, the, the proper name is a kiwi fruit, but no one ever says the full the full name. <laughs> Actually, it was never even a kiwi fruit to begin with. It used to be a Chinese gooseberry, but for 
marketing reasons, and I, I'm not really sure um, of all the detail, but the name was changed to kiwi fruit from Chinese gooseberry. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've definitely never heard, never heard that second one. Um, that is a great segue in some ways. You talked about many of the people of New Zealand coming to New Zealand um, and not necessarily being native to the island. Can you share a little bit about how your family ended up in New Zealand? Sure. Um, my mother's side of the family, her mother was Norwegian, her father was English and Irish. They both um, came to New Zealand at the beginning of last century. Um, so my mother was a first generation half Norwegian New Zealander. Um, my father's family, um, they were all from Latvia. My father was born in Kuldiga. Um, in the 1940s, they left Latvia. They spent several years in displaced persons camps in Germany. Um, a very similar story to many of the people, Latvian people scattered around the world at the moment. Um, they arrived in New Zealand in 1951 and um, originally settled in quite a small town in the middle of the North Island um, and eventually moved to Wellington. And that's where my parents met, got married and had me and my sister. Wonderful. Thank you for the summary. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start talking about what were the circumstances under which you started to think about the fact that maybe you would not live in New Zealand forever? Um, and whether that started with some thinking earlier on or some travels or whether, um, yeah, what, what did that process look like from thinking about maybe I won't live here to actually moving into, yes, I am making this decision? Well, I never really had the travel bug like many of my peers who, who went to London in their teens and never returned. Um, I didn't leave New Zealand until I was about 20, I think, and then um, never made it to Latvia until I was probably close to 40. Um, <clears throat> and Latvia had always been a, a sort of a presence in our home and our food and and customs and, and so on. But um, I really understood it when I went on that trip as an adult. My father wanted to celebrate his 65th birthday. So he took his children to Latvia so we could see where he was from. And he hadn't been there since the forties. Uh, on that trip to Latvia, I saw how my father felt so connected to his homeland despite being away for so many years. Um, I felt a real connection with the place too, because suddenly everything I'd eaten, listened to, had in my home was there all in one place on a bigger scale. It, it felt more like going home to me than, than leaving home. Um, I, at that point, I didn't consider living there, although maybe if circumstances were different, I possibly would have. Um, so I went back to New Zealand and just had it in the back of my mind how much I loved Latvia, how much I really felt comfortable there, how much more of it I wanted to see. And then um, 10 years ago in Christchurch, there began a sequence of earthquakes and they were pretty bad. Um, there was one in February 2011. It killed 185 people in Christchurch. Um, it decimated the center of the city, um, including my office, my husband's office. Um, it totally changed the landscape of our city. Um, it destroyed thousands of houses and many of us were left in a massive insurance battle. We were fighting the earthquake commission and our insurance companies. And there are people still fighting 10 years on. Um, for us, it took eight and a half years to settle our claim. 
Um, and by that time, I was absolutely exhausted. It was basically what had defined me for some years, fighting the Earthquake Commission, fighting the insurance company. And I felt I was losing my quality of life, losing my focus on things that really mattered. And I was determined that once we had our claim settled, we would go and live somewhere else. I There were two reasons for that. One was I didn't want to live anywhere that was earthquake prone. I wanted to live somewhere that there weren't those kinds of natural disasters, which leads to the, the main reason being that I didn't want to give any more energy or time to fighting um, a, a claim against an insurance company or the earthquake commission. Um, and so we, we did think about moving to Australia, but Australia, it's a great place for um, New Zealanders to go. It really does offer a great quality of life, but Australia does not treat New Zealanders the way New Zealand treats Australians. Um, if, for example, you lost your job in Australia, you would have to be completely self-sufficient. Um, medical care is expensive if you're not Australian. It can take, you know, it's costly and lengthy to become a resident, let alone a citizen. So um, by 2014, my daughter and I had obtained our Latvian passports, um, which really made me think this is where we could go and start a new life. Um, it's not going to be hard. We don't have to pay extra fees for my daughter to be at school. She won't be an international student. She will be a Latvian. Um, I really wanted to reconnect with where my people were from and see, you know, maybe I could get that feeling back that I had when I was there last. And um, I, I didn't want to rebuild our house. I didn't want to live in Christchurch any longer. Um, I, I just really wanted to get away. And you could look at it as running from, but I think it was running to, it was running to something. Um, I'm really pleased with, with that decision. So it, it sounds like the decision was, was being made as you were becoming perpetually exhausted by this process. So by the time that you were actually able to finish the process, you were, you were ready to go. Am I yes, understanding that yes, correctly? Yes, more, more than ready, yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. And talk a little bit about the logistical process of actually picking up and moving 17,000 kilometers um, across to another country. What were the things you needed to consider and what, what did that landing look like from a logistical point of view? Okay, we um, engaged a moving company to pack things for us. We packed like really personal things, but everything else, books, records, the furniture we chose to take with us, um, we left it to them to pack. It's an exhausting job. And if you can get a professional to do it, why not? So we did. Um, they made things a lot easier for us than, than they could have been. Um, everything we were left with, we put into a 20 foot container. It went into storage in Christchurch and initially it was only going to be stored for a few weeks. Then it would follow us to Latvia and hopefully the arrival would coincide with the end of our lease in Riga. But then COVID hit and our things could not leave New Zealand. They were just stuck in place. When they finally could leave, um, the ship was delayed several times, but that turned out to be a good thing because um, from Riga, I had had to decide where to live permanently, where in Latvia to put down roots. I was pretty sure it wasn't going to be Riga. I thought it would be somewhere out west, where, near where my people are from, but not entirely sure. And every day I was looking on SS.com thinking, where can I go, you know, and our goods were getting closer to arriving and it costs an awful lot to store things at customs. Um, you're hit with great daily fines if, if you don't get your things out of there in a hurry. Um, I found a property in Leopire, which was actually more of a derelict building really than um, 
anything livable. It was being converted into four apartments and I walked into the space and fell in love with it. Um, so I bought that, but it still needed to be constructed. So after seven months in Riga, we moved into um, a booking.com here in Leopard and stayed there for about four months until the apartment was about 90% ready. Um, we've been living here in the apartment ever since. Um, and again, it just it's just one of those things that feels completely right. I didn't look at any other properties here. I just it, it just felt like my nose was leading me here and, and this is where I have to be. I'm really close to where my family was from. Um, I'm actually having relatives popping out of the woodwork here, there and everywhere. It's wonderful. I have so many um, relatives living quite nearby that I, I'm still yet to meet, but that's something to look forward to. Mm. And can you describe Leopaya a little bit for, for people who don't know that city? Yeah, it's, um, oh, it's great. It really is. It's, um, it's kind of in some ways like a mini Riga in that we have everything here. I think possibly there's a perception that we're a little coastal town and we're missing out, but um, about the only things we don't have here are H&M, McDonald's and Ikea, but um, you know, you can order online. There's places, other places to buy food and, and things. And um, it, it doesn't detract from anything not having those places, but it's um, less built up than Riga. It's, um, you're more open to the sky. The buildings aren't as tall. It's easier to get places. The beach is um, a 15 or 20 minute walk from my place, depending on how fast you want to walk. The lake again is about 15 minutes walk from here. The canal, 10 minutes. Um, proximity is actually really important. Like I thought um, buying a car would be high priority, but I really think about it because I just don't need one. Whereas in New Zealand, I drove everywhere every day, even if it was just a five kilometer round trip, I would still drive, but here I walk. Um, Leopaya, it had, it was probably at its population peak about 30 years ago. There were 120,000 people here. Um, but for various reasons, including um, Latvia's joining the um, EU and also the global financial crisis that happened um, about 2007, 2008, there was quite a population exodus and now we're down to 70,000 people. But when I first arrived here, I could feel in the air that um, there was industry, there was so much going on. There was a kind of a almost imperceptible hum in the air, a buzz that things were happening, things were going on. It was being rebuilt again. Um, and it's still like that, you know, you can't walk for five minutes anywhere without seeing construction or renovation. Um, all these old beautiful buildings that were derelict are now being brought back to life. It's, um, yeah, there, there's, it has a slower, gentler pace of life than Riga, um, but it's not sleepy. You don't feel like you're living in a retirement village. There's, there's a lot happening, but as much as you want to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I always, uh, my perception of Leopaya is that it's a very, it reminds me of the West Coast of the US, which is kind of this, not sleepy, but laid back, like a laid back kind of, we're just not in as much of a rush as a capital city, um, but in a nice way, not in a... Yes not in a we're somehow smaller way but more like we choose to be <laughs> i would agree with that people are not um rushing from here to there um it's also very um creative and artistic i mean that describes latvia generally creative and artistic but here we seem to have um more than our fair share of rock stars and artists and things mm -hmm. there's a musician's walk of fame and there are musical notes um, on several streets here and you follow them. It's basi basically a pathway around the center of Leopire and um, they run across the street from us. We're on this um, amazing little tour of the city. Um, everywhere you look, there is a, a monument to someone who has created 
something, whether it's music or painting or whatever, it's um, it, it kind of inspires you to be better and be more creative. So we talked about the logistics. Let's move now into more of the internal, like emotional adjustment. Um, and maybe before we get to that, say a little bit about if, if there's anything to add about um, what efforts you made to adjust when you first uh, got to Latvia, maybe what your plans were, what actually, you know, came about. Um, and then tell us a little bit about some of the similarities and differences then that you started to realize in terms of where you had grown up and now living in this new place? Interestingly, there was never really a big adjustment period. I, um, possibly because it, it felt like I was walking into the familiar. Um, I grew up around Latvians. I grew up around the language, um, around the food. It wasn't like I was going into a totally alien environment. Um, I didn't, I, I don't think I needed to make a lot of adjustments, although um, moving to Leopire and actually beginning real life here, um, I think something I have learned is patience and tolerance. Um, whereas in New Zealand, if you were doing business with someone or engaging someone to work for you or whatever, um, you would pin down all the details. Um, it would be watertight, whereas here it's like, oh, it will get done, you know, and it does eventually. And <clears throat> I've learned to, to let go of my frustrations and um, impatience because things do happen here, um, not on my schedule, but um, maybe someone else's. And it, it does end up working out. So it, that's been really good for me. And I know... If, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that um, your family did not speak Latvian. Is that correct? Um, actually, my generation of my family is the only generation that didn't. My father, um, when he married my mother, his aunt came to live with us. And that's actually an interesting story in itself, which I'll tell you after this. Um, but my father and his aunt spoke English, um, sorry, Latvian every day around me, around my mm -hmm. sister. Um, but they didn't speak it to us because they thought it was a dying language. Um, Latvia was occupied. They thought that's the end of Latvia and Latvian. So they spoke it to themselves kind of maybe a little bit sadly, maybe in a bit of a melancholy, you know, we're the last ones kind of way. Mm -hmm. So um, English was my only real language that I was fluent in. Um, but going back to my great aunt and the reason that she lived with us, um, in the camps in Germany, um, if you had a child and you were unwed, your child was not allowed to live with you. So my grandmother was unwed. Her um, partner, my um, father's father, stayed behind in Latvia. Um, and my great aunt and her husband, who were married, took in my dad. So he lived with them. Um, so my dad became very, very close to his aunt. And she rather than her going into a home she lived with family so she lived with us for um the first 10 years of my life anyway and she she herself brought a lot of Latvian culture into our home especially with her sewing and her cross stitch she taught me how to sew and how to cross stitch and really grateful for that oh that's lovely <laughs> what a nice memory um the reason I bring up language is because language can be a, a significant transition um, and uh, kind of want, sometimes one of those pretty logical things to include in, you know, in your adjustment. Now, now I'm kind of going off and <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, let me start that over again. Um, 
but uh, let me kind of uh, pull my brain back. Um, so you're here, you arrived, you felt really good, it felt familiar, and perhaps it also in some ways helped that you had a, a mission, a, a set of things you needed to do in terms of um, not necessarily staying in Riga, but looking for a new place, looking for a home, um, enrolling your daughter in school. What are some of the things that you've noticed, and of course, from your personal experience, but what are the things that you've noticed that you gravitate towards that feel particularly um, maybe like emotionally close to you in terms of Latvians or the way that Latvians are? And what are some things that ended up being challenges for you? Okay. Um... Sometimes I'll be just walking around the streets here, maybe running an errand, and um, I will just stop and do a 360 degree turn and just look at all these old buildings and think, look at where you are. And sometimes this town and parts can feel almost like a theme park, but all the good things of a theme park, like it's so historical it's so old it has so much um richness and, and depth to it um occasionally I can't believe it and I feel like pinching myself how lucky are you to be living here um it's just incredible and I feel kind of emotional actually just just looking at this place and thinking this is where I've replanted my family's roots um <sighs> I I have met some really good friends here. I know they'll be very close friends for the rest of my life. Um, I'm so grateful to have met these people. I I found that I haven't had to go out seeking friendship, but it has come to me like the right people have just come into my life at the right time to um, help me achieve goals or just provide friendship. Um, so emotionally I feel really quite fulfilled living here um sometimes I think this building is really you know you could look at it as it's really spooky no one else lives here um it's really dark at night and I think oh my goodness I love that um <laughs> it's yeah it's just an incredible place um I know I keep saying that without actually um articulating what incredible means but um, for me, it means um, I've basically been able to let go of the worries and stresses that I had prior to moving here. And any stresses that I have now are of my own creation. Like I choose to, to take on something that's stressful rather than it being thrown at me and I'm struggling to fight it. Um, I get to choose what I do. Um, which is, it's great. Um, the things that have been challenging, um, let's see, there's, um, food is not quite so bad as it was. Um, when I was here last as a vegan, that was, um, gosh, it must've been about 13 years ago. Um, I just about starved to death. Um, luckily, it was summer and there was a lot of fruit and vegetables to eat. But um, yeah, I had a few low blood sugar episodes then because you couldn't just buy ready meals or anything. Um, and the selection in restaurants was not, not great. Um, but now there's a lot of um, imported processed foods coming from, say, Poland, Germany, Estonia. Um, I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Um, living in temporary holiday accommodation was kind of difficult. I didn't have a full kitchen um, in either place. And so I couldn't gather together everything that I'd normally have in my pantry. But um, now I'm at the point almost where I was in New Zealand, where I've got a full kitchen with every appliance and I've got all the ingredients I need to, to make anything. So that's... Um, not an issue anymore. Um, I feel like, um, I think I mentioned the cultural element of living here, how there's just so much um, 
creativity going on and um I've met a group of people who I didn't realize they knew each other and then they'd say to me oh, I met them at art school or something so these people are all um creating and making and it's um like I said it's making me want to create more as well um yeah wonderful wonderful um What is perhaps an example of something that feels very different and very different in the context? I mean, it sounds like emotionally you're very connected. You feel very good about being in this place. But um, I found that having grown up somewhere else unexpectedly, not realizing that that influenced me there are certain things here that just feel very not that way. Um, so what are one or perhaps two things that seem very different that things, yeah, that things happen differently here? Um, interestingly here, um, personal space is something that comes up fairly often. Um, there is a lot of space here in Latvia. There's forests and oceans and, and, and things, beaches, but um, when you're walking down the footpath, for example, like in New Zealand, we drive cars on the left-hand side of the road, so um, <clears throat> you keep to the left of the footpath when you're walking, it's just like an unwritten rule, and you don't bump into anybody, so here I'm doing the same thing when I'm walking down the footpath, I'm keeping hard right, you know, expecting everyone else oncoming to be on their hard right, but um, often people will walk down the middle of the footpath and you'll need to actually swerve so they don't bang into you. Um, or they will walk straight towards you. Um, one day I was carrying my daughter's sled through the center of town, as you do in Leopaya. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's another difference between here and there. It, it, you know, it's not uncommon to look out your window and see people carrying or pulling sleds because they're going sledding. Um, so I was carrying this sled, I was keeping hard right you know as hard right as I possibly could with a sled and I saw there was a woman coming towards me and I thought well you know she'll keep to her right but instead she just kept walking right into me right into the sled um I still haven't quite figured out why she did that and I have been elbowed on the streets before when I couldn't go any further to to the right um in shops people um do queue up really closely behind you the two meter rule the the marks on the floor don't really seem to mean a lot to some people so they'll stand you know right behind you um and i have wondered if that comes from a place of needing to be near the head of the queue um because you need some bread or you need to feed your family um that's that's really different from where I come from. There was never that um, desperation, that um, poverty, that that need to feed your family like there was in Latvia in several decades earlier this or last century. Um, and I, I do wonder if that's why people feel they need to get to the checkout, pay for their food and get it home. Um, in New Zealand, you know, if you went in a hurry, you just say to someone else, oh, you go before me. But here they're like, you know, I want to go first. I want to get my food. Um, that's That has been kind of a, a strange thing. It's a very small thing, but it is a kind of a strange thing. Um, something else I've noticed is um, when it comes to gender differences, um, men here can be quite chivalrous in a lot of ways they will do things for you but they also won't talk to you and say what do you need what do you want they'll make an assumption this is what she wants and then they'll go and do it um in some ways it's really nice but in other ways it can be kind of frustrating <laughs> like you think I would have liked to have had some input or you know maybe you could have asked me first but I'm finding that um I'm getting a lot of help with people carrying my groceries upstairs and my online shopping orders and, and things like that without even having to ask. You know, someone might see that um, I'm struggling to carry something up the stairs and, and they'll just grab it off me and carry it up for me. It's, it's really lovely. Um, that kind of leads on to um, the LGBTQI plus thing as well. Um, in New Zealand, 
I think if people aren't completely open-minded, you know, at the very least they're tolerant. Um, here it's um, very closeted. Um, I think people are afraid to be the, their true selves. Like they could actually be in physical danger if, if you know, if they were their, their true selves. Um, I think our lawmakers have to seriously consider the harm they're causing people by not allowing equal rights for all. Um, that That's probably one of the biggest changes I would really like to see here in Latvia. I'd like to see us move with the times and mm -hmm. um, be where we should be compared with other countries in the world. That's a great transition to just a, well, it's a, it's a big question, but however you'd like to, to approach it is what do you think now you've been here for, you know, a bit over a year, what does your next year or two look like as you continue to adjust and settle in here? Okay. Um, life used to be fairly easy to predict pre COVID. Um, so all the things we thought were going to happen last year um, didn't happen. So it is getting harder to plan. But I've thought that, um, you know, you could live your life thinking the worst is happening, the worst is going to happen, and just hide away and not do anything, not be brave. But I thought, no, I'm going to live my life as though the, the best is yet to come. So um, I... Um, this, this building has been divided into four apartments. And like I said, I'm the only person living here. Um, two others were sold. And I was talking to the developer who said he was going to show the apartment next door to someone else. And I thought, no, I really like it. I really like that apartment. Um, I'd actually been hoping to buy some of the space in it to incorporate into my own apartment. But by then all the plumbing and el electricity had gone in and it wasn't possible. And I thought this could be something for me to do. My family's business in New Zealand is property management. And I thought, well, they can do that there. I can probably manage to do it here. Um, so I bought that apartment. It should be completed in a few weeks time. Um, and I had actually come here with the intention of just taking early retirement and not really doing a whole lot and then I thought there's too much going on here and I really want to be part of it I really need to get back into you know throw myself into something with a passion and I thought I love these old buildings I really do and then one day I was standing on my terrace looking into our yard and um, there are a couple of old outbuildings there they look like they might fall down in the next big gust of wind um, but it suddenly came to me that I could turn these into apartments too. So <laughs> I bought the outbuildings. Um, <clears throat> the plans are underway with the architect at the moment, and I'm going to be turning those into, yeah, like I said, more apartments. I think probably a um, some will be long-term rental, some will be short-term rental, but I'm feeling really enthusiastic about this. I feel like... Um, I don't know, all my life I'd sort of um, gone from job to job and I've really enjoyed some of those jobs, but never really felt them in my heart, never really felt passionate. Whereas now I'm just, I'm beyond excited about what I'm doing here. Um, and I think it also helps me feel more rooted in this place. So I really, you know, I'm really committed to, to this. I'm not just going to jump on a plane when I can and return back to New Zealand because this is where I've made my life and my business. Um, it's, I feel like it's where my soul is. Wow. Yeah. That comes across. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to hear that, that you feel so, um, so enthusiastic and so forward looking about it. Um, and I think that's a great place to ask if you have any final thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I, I kind of like to sell Leopard to everybody really. Um, also New Zealand, people, people do often ask me, you know, why did you come to Latvia? You're from New Zealand. Everyone wants to go to New Zealand. Everyone wants to live there. Um, it's, New Zealand isn't perfect. It's great. It really, really is great. But I felt like my time there was um, 
complete. Um, I I would love to see more people coming to Leopaya, bump up our population a bit more. We've got a whole bunch of buildings here that are just waiting to be loved back into life. Um, the cost of living here, wow, um, far less than even Riga, which is pretty inexpensive by international standards. Um, people are, I think, possibly happier, less rushed here. Um, I, I would love people to come and visit us when they can. I think that would be wonderful to, to have friends from Riga or family and friends from New Zealand to come and see us. Um, I, I want to share our beautiful historical city with people. I want them to walk on the beach and um, experience it, not just in summer when it's at its brightest best, but also on maybe a dark winter night when it's magical. It's um, transformed into, um, I don't know, an alien landscape. Sometimes we go to the beach at 11 o'clock or midnight and um, we, we put our long winter coats and our hats on and we pretend it's the moon. So um, this place can be anything you want it to be. Oh, that's a wonderful place to end it. Well, thank you, Anita, so much for sharing a bit of your story, a little sliver and um, your enthusiasm and, and feeling rooted in this place really comes across. So thank you so much for telling us a little bit about how that ended up being. Thank you, Mara.